Today I'm joined by Pet Cash. Wimbledon champion 1987, five-time Grand Slam finalist, two times David Cup, Davis Cup champion. Welcome, Pat. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Pat, it's my honor. Normally, I don't do that because I want the guests to talk about, but I have to start with a, uh, with a short story. I okay. applied for a strength and conditioning position in the LTA back in 2007, 2008. I got to the second round. I was interviewed by a panel. And one of the persons on the panel was your former trainer, Ann Quinn. So yeah. they asked me questions. And um, at the end of the interview, they were like, oh, all good. Do you have any questions for us? And I, <laughs> I was like, I have one question for Ann Quinn. And she was like, oh, yeah. what, 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 do, what do you want to know? And I said, how was working with Pet Cash? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and now I have the honor to speak to you. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope she gave you a nice answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, Pat, you have been famous for your Wimbledon climb, and I'm not going to talk about that because you probably talked about that many times. But there's also a story to it that apparently the winner have to, has to give his record to the club, and you change the record or something? Um, gee, I don't remember that. Um, no, no, that's not true. You don't have to give your racket to the to the club, but they they did have uh, a museum. They were building the museum not not you know uh, not long after that. So they they did ask me for some um, for the original headband, and which I, I which is in the, in the museum. You can find that there. Um, but. I don't remember. I mean, you might be right. I mean, that, that's a long time ago now. It's 30 something years ago. So um, it's, um, I do have, uh, I do have a couple of the rackets left. An actual fact, um, I just found the one that I won, hit the, uh, that I hit the winning ball with. Um, I thought it was gone and I, I, I found it. Um, my friend of mine back in Australia goes, Hey, do you want this? And I was like, Oh, <laughs> That's the one, the same, same grip, everything. Uh, and I said, yeah, I want that, you know. He said, oh, I've just been, I've, I've kept it and I've got your Davis Cup trophy as well. So I was moving houses and everything and uh, being my best friend, he said, I'll, I'll keep them. Um, and in actual fact, it was funny because I know a couple of years, but he said, you know what, I had it hanging up into my in my garage, just sitting there. And also Yvonne Lendl's racket. He said, I said, oh, yeah, I remember I got that. I asked Yvonne for a racket, but it wasn't that uh, from Wimbledon it was later on later that year I said can I have a racket so I've got the two rackets of 87 and and he and my friend said you know what I just hung it up in my in my garage and I said weren't you worried about it get stolen he said listen if anybody comes into my house and is going to steal something they're not going to go for two old rackets that they think are 30 years old and broken strings right they're going to go straight for the tv or the computer I said, ah, it's good thinking. He said, they'll probably be looking around the back. If I was hiding it, then they'd probably think, oh, this is special. <laughs> so he had it just hanging up there for years. I completely forgot about it. Pat, in your life as an athlete, what was your darkest moment? Oh, uh, gee. I mean, I had a lot of injuries. Um, as, as you know, I, I, you know, retrospect, maybe I trained too hard. Um, I had it. We talked about Anne Quinn. She was just fantastic. Uh, you know, we, we were very cutting edge at, at the time of what we knew. Um, and now, of course, 30 years later, we know, know a lot more about recovery, about physiotherapy, about rehab. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of work, um, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of stretching, a lot of recovery, uh, all sorts of little ex I learned, you know, to do the little small exercises to strengthen your back and your knees and all that sort of thing. But, you know, I probably, you know, went um, maybe too hard and, and I got into a chain of injury, recovery, injury, recovery. So there was always something that was, uh, that was um, setting me back. And I think, I think probably the, the, the trickiest time in my career not my personal life. Um, had some uh, dark times then, but I had a a knee tracking issue, which was um, uh, it's quite simply is the knee the, the knee when the knee moves. Well, you'll know this, but I'm trying to explain it in a simple way. But 
the knee moves into a uh, into a into a groove in between the in the bones, and it's supposed to go in that groove all the time. Now, if your muscles are imbalanced, the kneecap will move across and then grind into into the side of that uh, called a trochlea or the groove the groove, and that will start instead of going up and nice up and down, it go and it will go along the side there. Now, this was supposed to be easy to reasonably easy to fix, and I had Jenny McConnell, who's very who's become famous um, McConnell taping and um, most of the knee taping you see the shoulder taping and she invented that you know, good 30, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago um, and still being used, used today. And so I went with her to try and get, get the knee fixed. And she said, look, this will, it's really tricky. You have to be really careful and you have to, it'll take you, you know, somewhere between one or two months, to do you know maximum three months anyway a year later i still can't do it and you know and she kept saying um, my knees were very unusual very strange started getting all these special treatment massaging uh various things on onto the trying to loosen my kneecap up my knees were very tight and you know so here i'm a year later and saying you know this should have only taken a couple of months and i'm watching all these players come through and players I used to beat and they'll have some selling in the top 10 and then it was come thir you know, 13 months then 14 months and I, I literally I still she said you cannot go back on the tennis court until you get this right you will not last more than a month and I couldn't walk upstairs I couldn't walk downstairs I couldn't I just I literally couldn't walk up and downstairs with so much pain so here I was um, I remember the probably the worst time is I, I was I had all my legs strapped up and I had this uh, biofeedback machine, so electrodes on there to read the muscle, uh, timing of the muscle. One muscle would go, on the, the quad goes before the other one. It's all quite compli complicated, but I had all these machines strapped up to me and my legs taped up. And, and I remember trying to walk up the stairs and, and I just couldn't. And I just broke down into tears and I was literally, when I say here, Trying, I, was, I was pulling my hair out in frustration. I was literally trying to pull my hair out. I was so angry, so sad, and I was just, I couldn't, you know, I was just a, I was just a mess. I just, um, that's all, I'm never, ever going to get this. But um, I did, bit by bit by bit, and you know what? It's uh, That knee has been perfect ever since, but I had, it took me 16 months to get back so I could, I could start running and playing, but that was... Um, that was a really dark time because I didn't break anything. I didn't snap anything. I didn't rip. I didn't tear off. It was just that I just couldn't get this little thing working. And then I had the same problem with my other knee, ironically, and, and I did get it quicker, but I didn't get it perfectly. And this is that, that, that knee I've ended up having, I've had six or six, about six surgeries on it, more minor, but, but because it was grinding, <laughs> kept chip, things keep chipping off. So, the injuries are the worst things, I think, for, for a player. And then coming back is, is so frustrating because you, you go back to being a club player. You know, you're not much better than a, club, a local club player. And you have to build yourself up and you know that you're a Wimbledon champion. You know that. And, of course, as soon as you get back on and start playing, everybody wants to beat you because you're a Wimbledon champion who's, you know, half, half the speed. So they ruthlessly want to beat you and you – you know, want to you want you want to be back to where you were, and uh, um, it was you know, it was the knee, and then it was the Achilles, and then it was the, the back, and then it was the other knee, and then you know, then it was the other knee again. It just went after a, after a while, I just kept going backwards and forwards, one injury after the other, and and uh, you know, if you look at my career, I had a very actually, as far as matches are concerned, I had a very pretty short career. Um, I just crammed a lot into a few years. The rest of it was on and off the circuit the last probably, I don't know, eight years of my career. Yeah. I've written that down as a question for later, but it, it, it fits perfectly here. I mean, for me, I, I was an avid, still am an avid tennis fan. You were always up there with the Beckers, Edbergs, Wielanders and Landers, but your career seemed to be a bit shorter. Is that due to the, what you just explained? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, um, you know, I came through, uh, pretty young there's not many players who do come through quite quickly in australia australians typically take a while to get get, get going uh leighton hewitt came through pretty very quickly the 16 year old which is uh, amazing so at 19 i was uh you know i got to the us open and i got the top 10 um uh won davis cup at 18 and when uh was it just 19 maybe 18 i think and then um 
you know, I played the Davis Cup, then I had a good year the next year, semi-final US Open, semi-final at Wimbledon, uh, and then I hurt my back. So I was out. Um, and that's when I met Anne. Um, I had a, my, my girlfriend was pregnant, so I had to pull my finger out, really. I, and um, the, uh, my back surgery that I had then, um, they, they, were, they were reasonably confident I'd come back, but they, again, they just didn't know enough about the physiotherapy and all the small muscles and the things like that. So I just went on a campaign to get as strong as, as I possibly could. And that's when I found Anne. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I came back pretty well, I thought. Um, and then uh, I had my appendix attack, had an appendix attack in 1986, just, just before Wimbledon, just as I was coming back. And I ended up getting to the quarterfinal, playing really well. And that was, I think, I think still at this day, it's the highest jump uh, anybody's ever had. I was 400 or 300 and something in the world, and I got to the quarterfinals of Wimbledon, and I moved up to 70 or something. I don't know. Uh, so I think it was one of the highest, if not the highest, jump ever. Um, the ATP, the ranking system was a bit strange in those days. Um, so I had then I had a few good years, a few good, and then after that was just I broke my Achilles in one at Wimbledon '87, broke my Achilles in '89, uh, and then after that I was just on and off, on and off for the rest of my career. So I suppose I really only had sort of three, uh, maybe four good, really good years. Yeah. What was your best moment? Well, my be I think um, uh, yeah, my non my career career, of course. I think, uh, and it sounds a bit strange saying this now, but I think if you're slightly older, you're probably too young. But maybe maybe you'll appreciate this. Um, but I, I regarded Wimbledon and and Davis Cup wins as equal, um, as, as just as important. Um, Wimbledon, not personally, of course. And I think that's become more famous, Davis Cup. Uh, unfortunately, over the last 10 years or so, within a few exceptions, a uh, few countries' exceptions, it has lost its luster. And, um, but in, back in my era, there was everybody played Davis Cup. You know, everybody. And it was as important as the Grand Slams. The first things you did in the year, you knew your Grand Slam schedules, and then you waited for the draw. You planned your whole year around Davis Cup and the Grand Slams. And everything else was you know, a warm up tournament or, or whatever. There was it was a it was it was a tournament. Of course you've tried tried hard, but you know, I always felt I, I was fit and I liked playing five sets and, and uh it was a true test and that was what the Grand Slams and that's what Davis Cup was all about. So for me Davis Cup was was hugely important. Um you know McEnroe was always incredibly passionate about that. You know, Borg as well. Um and then, you know, in around about the early early nineties Uh, I remember very clearly Andre Agassi, um, you know, the, it went and all over the media how he decided he didn't want to play and he and he, he faked an injury or something, and it was it was absolutely enormous news. I mean, it was worldwide news that Agassi he was talking to say, his manager or somebody and in a in a restaurant, and literally behind him in a booth was a media person, and they heard, overheard him saying, "I don't want to play Davis Cup. I'm sick. I don't want blah blah blah." And um, and this guy released it and said Agassi faked this injury. Um, he does any to, to not so not play Davis Cup, and that was massive, absolutely massive. And then Sampras goes, you know what? I'm not going to play Davis Cup either. And those two guys are the first two guys that said they're not going to play it. Then Philip Boussis decided that he didn't want to play Davis Cup for Australia. That was the biggest mistake because Australians will not accept that. They would not accept that. So he. Uh, Mark's a really nice guy, but he didn't. Uh, that wasn't a great, a great move for him. Um, he he got such a hard time, such bad, bad publicity in Australia for that. Uh, but then, bit by bit, it's become commonplace. Well, you know what? It's more important for me to do my ranking, and and you know that's what Sampras said, and that's well, I'm going to concentrate on my on my own myself. And we are a selfish bunch of people because we are in an in, in, in an individual sport, but. You know, Davis Cup is still, still to, the, to say Australia is, is, is massively important, and uh, um, and it was absolutely. I, I couldn't separate Wimbledon. The Davis Cup win was probably more fun because I had my teammates to cheer with me and have fun and laugh and have the dinner afterwards. And so, any of those Davis Cup wins were fantastic. Yeah. 
And that's also, I think, where it started for you, right? In 86, you won the Davis Cup almost single-handedly, right? I mean, you won your singles and the doubles. And then 87, you came, came to the Aussie Open final. Mm. 87, Wimbledon. And then 88, Aussie Open final, two points short of the title. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, very close. A um, couple of good finals I played. Uh, I think the one that really got away was the 87 one at uh, the last one at Kuyong on the grass. I played Edberg in the final. Um, I'd beaten him in the Davis Cup a couple of months beforehand. Well, not even that, probably six weeks. Um, you know, I, I thought I could, I, I could win that one. Um, unfortunately, I picked up a shoulder injury along the way. And, and just if you look at some of the replays on the match, uh, you can see my serving was pretty average. It was about, uh, I could only serve maybe three-quarter pace. And he jumped to a two sets to love lead, killed you know easily, and then I clawed my way back to fifth set, but uh, I couldn't I couldn't get it. So I felt like that was the one that got away. I just I just really couldn't. Uh, well, I was, I was struggling on my serve. Um, and if it wasn't any other tournament, I probably wouldn't have played. I would have just defaulted. But uh, you know, can't default Australian Open final uh, against Philander. It was you know I played. Um, yeah, we had, that was five sets as well, eight, eight, six in the fifth set, and that was a that was a great match. I think beating Lendl in the, the number one player in the world, beating him in the semi final, just took a little bit of sting out of me, and I just didn't quite, couldn't quite. Uh, uh, I went to eight, six in the fifth set. I just couldn't quite get on top of Matz's serve. He was serving really well in that that last fifth set, and and um, so to lose two times in a row in the Australian Open final in in close five sets is. Uh, is a heartbreaker. It certainly, every time I go back to, to Melbourne Park, um, it, it breaks my heart. I got to be honest. But you know, I, uh, you know, I look back at a career and you say, okay, what did I really want to achieve? And I, I wanted to win Wimbledon. I wanted to win Davis Cup. And I wanted to win the Australian Open. And geez, I was within two points of achieving all my goals, really, in, in a in about in over about three or four years. So mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty good. Yeah. If you could travel back in time. 10, 20, 30 years, what advice would you give a younger pet? Oh, well, again, it's, it's sort of, um, I think I would have probably, I would have given myself some advice. I don't know if I would have listened, though. This is the thing. Uh, um, I, I think I probably was too, a bit too intense. Um, uh, probably work, maybe worked a little too hard. I needed to work a little bit. Um, slightly more relaxation, that sort of side of the, of the game. And we, there's an element to, of course, you've got to be super fit. And we know more about, I said, we know more about recovery now, ice baths, stretching, all that sort of stuff. So you're able to back up. The players are, can, get, can recover quickly. Um, we, my day, we didn't have that. So he just kept pushing through. So, I mean, I worked unbelievably hard, unbelievably hard, probably too hard. So, I needed to maybe, maybe do probably a little bit more meditation. I, although I did have a sports psychologist, I did a lot of work on that that aspect of my career. Um, uh, then, which was just a new, um, it was a new uh, part of sport, really, so sports psychology. It was just coming in, and I think that was hugely beneficial to me. Um, but I was, it was a very un, I had a lot of stress off the court. You know, I had a, a two young, I had, uh, two young children um, with my girlfriend who uh, we weren't, you know, we were splitting up, we were separating. And, you know, that was very stressful to, to deal with that. And I think all that stress actually sort of, uh, uh, I think it, 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 it didn't help me as far as, as uh, staying physically strong and physically fit and, and, you know, the extra external stress, And so somehow you need to be able to release that mm. or manage it. I mean, ideally release it, um, managing it. I could a little bit, but, um, you know, I suppose in a way I would have said, hey, forget, chill out. Don't worry about it. I mean, I, I, was, I, was, I was a world champion racket thrower and racket smasher. I mean, I, I, was, I, was, I was very good at it. I, was, I had it down to a fine art of how to break a racket uh, in either one piece or a million and, million and one, depends on the, how, how I threw it. But, Uh, I can honestly say that in 20 years, 
in the last 20 years and I'm still playing legends events and uh, coaching a lot, I, I have not broken a racket. So, uh, you know, I said, chill out, you know, don't worry about it. There's, a, there's another point. And that's the great thing about tennis is that, you know, I le- you learn to, hey, you lost a point, but hey, you got another chance to, to, to make up for that and, and let's get on with it. And so uh, that sort of attitude, I think, is, is a better attitude than just getting angry. Yeah, I believe that. Um, in tennis, we quite often see if the player doesn't have results, then he or she changes the coach. Sometimes that's justified, sometimes not. Mm. You had a bit of a bad boy image for whatever reason, but um, you stuck with your coach for most of your career. Why was that? Uh, well, I think Ian, Ian Barclay understood me very well. Um, uh, again, in those days, you, you, you're stuck with a coach for a long time. I think most of the players had coaches for several years. Uh, there may be a whole career. Um, you know, Villander did, uh, Lendl did with, with Roach and um, yeah, McEnroe didn't really have a coach, but did that. There was, you know, <laughs> Becker at uh, Kunta Bresnik, you know, and, and that's, you know, that, that was what it was. You, you went through so, certainly a large part of your career with a coach and trying to develop and get better and better. Um, and, you know, you get an understanding and you have a, you make a game plan and, and, and you just try and, try and, work on it together uh you know some i understand if sometimes things have really broken down and you can't talk to somebody anymore or you don't like them but i knew ian since i was 12 he was like my second father to me um so um you know the relationship was was very good in that way and you know it wasn't until i was i don't know my late late 20s or mid mid to late 20s that uh you know i was kept coming on and off an injury and so ian had to go and get a proper job he worked for the ten, l- l- uh, in london he worked in england lta for a bit and um you know so and then i i started to relearn about the game of tennis and i was injured uh and maybe one of the best things that happened to me in my career that uh, i ran into a biomechanist and and started to learn about the science of, of body movement and, and and tennis and i think that's a a hugely important uh, area of, of tennis i really don't i think it's almost more important than than um than when i have experience on on a tennis court is to understand how the body moves and and that was um i was lucky that i had a biomechanist called brad langevad um and he's um uh he's australian uh and he was he was a tennis player who played on the lower circuits and went quit and went to went to university and learned all about body movement and came back with a theory on on how tennis is supposed to be played. And uh, uh, the, the, the crazy thing was one, when I was towards the end of my career and I'm, I was coming back from, from an injury and I was playing Wimbledon qualifying. So I think I was the only, I think I'm the only Wimbledon champion to ever have to go back and play qualifying. But I went back and played qualifying. I qualified and in the last round, he um, handed me, a, he came out and said hello. And I've done some work with him fixing my, uh, fixing my serve after, After back surgery, I had to change my serve, um, and uh, he helped me do that and a, a little bit. And he came up to me afterwards, and I said, "Hey, how's it going?" Blah blah blah. I said, "My serve's going well." He said, "Yeah, look, it's it can be better." He said, "Look, here's a, here's a letter, uh, but don't open it until you finish Wimbledon." And he said, "Promise me you don't. I won't open it." And I said, "Okay, I won't open it." And I forgot about it. I put it in my bag, and anyway, a few weeks, a week later, or whatever it was, two weeks later, I. After uh, uh, cleaning out my bag at Wimbledon, and after, and oh, this letter! So I opened the letter, and it, it was basically said, "I saw you play one match, and I've written down all the things that you can't do, and all the things shots that you, you need to improve, and 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 how the players can beat you." And he knew my game inside out from watching one match. And I so I got straight up. I said, "How do you know that? Have you been following me everywhere?" He said, "No, no, no. I just saw one match." I said, "Biomechanically, you can't do this. You can't do that. Can't do this." And, um, you know, you, you never get the power that you want until you fix all these things. And I was at the end of my career. I needed power. I was all the injuries. I was a bit slower than I was. And I, I said, tell me more. I want to know. And uh, so we, we worked on my get, rebuilding my game for over about two years or three years. Uh, so I'm sort of 28, 29, 30. 
And um, I was kind of a bit too late then. I couldn't really get, but, you know, my, the age of 30, my serve was much harder than it was early, for, for, throughout my career. It was crazy. My forehand was better. My volleys were better. Everything was better. But I, at that stage, I was kind of burnt out and I didn't, didn't want to go back and start playing um, future tournaments or that sort of thing. I had family and I just said, look, I, I, I couldn't get into the tournaments. I just couldn't get people were sick of me. And I said, oh, and you know, cash again. Why don't you just retire? And I was 30. I said, you're 30. Why don't you just retire? And that was, that was the attitude then. Once you hit 30, you were done. Finished. And I'd like to go back in time to those, some of those people that the ATP included. And I said, you know, we should, why don't we have a rule that Grand Slam champions can get a wild card if they want to play? And it doesn't take away another wild card from a, from a junior or whatever. Yeah, great idea. Everybody signed it. All the Grand Slam champions signed it, uh, handed it to them, and they went, nah, not interested. You know, I want to go back to those people and go, what? So, you remember you said I was 30, I was done? Remember this guy, you know this guy better who's still playing? Yeah. This guy, you know, and I want to go back and say, listen, I knew that there's still life left in a player at 30. You're mad. I mean, we laugh, but you laugh about that now. But the, my era, when you're 30, you were done. You were regarded as done. Retire, go back and do something else. So I, that really pissed me off. And I'm, I can just see I'm still a bit pissed off about it. It was just such <laughs> a stupid, stupid attitude. And I was really excited about playing tennis. I was playing really well. I was fit. All my injuries had disappeared. So, um, but now I'm passing that on in my, my tennis coaching knowledge. So, um, so, you know, tennis is tennis coaching. I think you're a, you're a type of a manager, like a football manager. So you don't run the fitness session. You don't run the defensive, uh, plays, but you're involved in the fitness. You're involved in the fitness plays. You're involved in, in getting the, the players. You're in, you're managing a, a, the team or the player. Uh, the tactics, all that sort of stuff. But it doesn't mean that you actually go out and you do all the drills. You have somebody somebody else doing it. And that's what tennis has become. And that's that was a, a team that I had. I had a sports psychologist. I had Ann Quinn, a sports psychologist. I had various people that, that would would work with me and a, and, a phys, and a physio. And in actual fact, in 1987, I had so many people on my team that I couldn't get them in the box, the Royal Box. Oh, the Royal Box. I mean, the, the players' box, um, because they they didn't accept them. They said, they said, who are these people? I said, well, it's Pat's sports psychologist, it's Pat's physio, and it's Pat's trainer. And they went, no, 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 you can't have these people. And I said, what? I said, no, they're my people. What do you mean I can't have? Them? No, you can't have these people. Nobody has these people. This is ridiculous. You got too many people. And we're not giving you tickets. I went, but I have them. This is a, these are my team. I said, no, no, you don't have a team like that. They literally said, no, you cannot have a team of, of more than one person. And now look at it. They had to extend the, extend the box now. But then they literally wouldn't give me any tickets. But you know, they had to find tickets around the place they eventually. So, um, but that was, it was obvious to me that, that that's what a player needed. And, um, and my coach knew it. He didn't, he wasn't, a, he, was very, he, was, he knew various things about everything, uh, little things, but he wasn't a specialist. So, and that's what it, that's what the teams are now. They're specialists, whatever fitness, mental, whatever. And 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 you you are you're the car and you're the and you're the driver uh, as as a player. Yeah, yeah. I've even seen nowadays uh, there are teams with two strength and conditioning coaches for one tennis player. Yeah, I don't know how that works. I got to be honest. Yeah, um... yeah. I think there's a lot of conflict in a few of those teams. I know, I know, I know there is, but yeah. But, uh, because because that's the other thing, you know, not there's always stuff to learn. So a strength and conditioning coach may be good in one area, but he may not be an expert in another area. So you have to be open minded enough. And as a and the problem is that you know these certain people will talk to the players, and you know the politics involved in that. Some of this is is crazy. I mean, I'm not I'm not a, I'm not into politics, but everybody needs to get on well. And, um, you know, somebody has a word, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. And then there's bad blood in the, in the, in the team. And then you just want to say, okay, look, I just forget it. I'm going to, you go, go ahead and do your own thing. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it can get very messy. Yeah, I believe that. Um, the theme of this interview series is high-performance athlete, but also a little bit mainly around Olympic athletes. You participated in the demonstration event in 1984. How was yeah. your experience? Terrible. 
That's why I didn't go to ADA. It was, it was awful, absolutely awful. Um, that was a demonstration. They're bringing tennis back in. Um, I flew. I got the semi. Uh, what was that? Eighty-four. So I got the semi-final at Wimbledon. I came home, needed to rest, and it was the Olympics. And I said, okay, you know, it's a demonstration sport. It was in UC, it was in uh, UCLA, um, uh, at Los Angeles, and one of the Aussie guys went there early. I missed out the uh, the opening ceremony. The tennis was in the second week. The opening ceremony was there the first week. He wanted to go. Kind of, you know, I regret, I regret it now not going. Uh, I think I would have really got fired up, but I was tired. And so I flew over for a couple of days, three days practice. Um, they didn't even have, they was, we're in a dormitory. I was meeting the two Aussie guys were in the room, small room. He had a proper bed. I had a pull out bed out the wall. So it just, it just flopped out of the wall. And, and it was, and it was like that. So flopped out the wall. I was sleeping like that and they had no blinds. So, I was jet lagged, so the sun would come up at five o'clock. There was no blinds, there was no toilet. You had to walk down there, there to the toilet, and everybody hated us because we we're pro players. They were still amateurs, so everybody, nobody, you know, maybe liked us tennis players being there. Said, what are you doing there? Uh, it was absolute shambles. Um, and I said, I said, screw this. I'm not going to, to Seoul. This is, this is shocking. It's one of the things I regret in my career because I really do think I could have won the gold medal. But you know, you have to be fired up for it and keen and um uh i think most of the players didn't turn on i think don't think becca went i don't think Lend Lendl didn't go so not many of the players did i think it was only in barcelona the year after that uh i think rossi won but agassi turned up and a few of the guys most of the steffi graf i think she won didn't she um so the players started turning up but uh, until then, nobody regarded it. We sort of thought, well, no, tennis is not supposed to be in the Olympics. We didn't, we were, it was amateurs. We didn't, we just felt, didn't feel like we should be there. We were treated poorly. And, um, uh, you know, obviously attitudes changed and I wish I had, had done that. And we had Davis Cup. So we, Davis Cup was a big thing for us. Yeah. You know, I know it sounds stupid, but we said, well, a gold medal doesn't really matter. It doesn't mean anything because, it's, you know, nobody plays tennis at the Olympics. So it didn't have that same same thing and you know i mean in my opinion i think some of the gold medals now you can get gold medals for just about anything um some of the sports i never i didn't even know there were sports uh, you get gold medals for it so it's it's good for participation but i mean really you know hey i won a gold medal i did one arm rowing 100 meter one arm one 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 arm rowing what the hell i never australia won a gold medal so i was happy about that it was one of a few gold medals we won in Brazil, but I never even knew it was a sport. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's nice to win a gold medal, but it's nice to win a gold medal in a sport that there's more than about 20 people in. <laughs> what are the habits that make you a successful athlete and person? Um, I think the main thing is open-mindedness. Um, I think, I think having... Being open-minded, I think, has really been uh, very important. And I think that's why I, I had, I developed this team and why I, I realized I needed some, needed uh, uh, help and I needed to improve in certain areas. I think the determination to be as good as you possibly can uh, is, is the most important thing. Um, and, you know, to leave without getting obsessed by changing things i think you gotta stick by a path but you also have to have an open mind about what what path that is or if somebody can help you become become better um and uh, you know I, i think the goal just to, to, to strive and be the best to be the best is is a, is a good way because it's i suppose you never fully fully uh satisfied which is one of the disappointing things because you've always got things to improve um but it also it keeps you away from uh slightly goal orientated uh success so in other words you're always looking slightly down the down the path and saying well you know i'll play better next week i'll play i'll, I'll, I'll work on this this week uh, yeah yes yeah, wimbledon time but you know i've got things to work on if i can improve if i can do that the results will come And I think, you know, having using the sports psychologist and having that sort of attitude of 
you know, setting the point up well. That was that was what we did at, in um, a lot of during the Wimbledon during that year, couple of years. I worked as a sports psychologist. Was having a plan to set the point up and 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 and, and try and finish it off. It wasn't about hey, you got to win. It was about if you can set the point up well, if you can do this and and get into the position, get in, get yourself into the position where you can finish the win the point, finish the point, and you can do that enough times, then success will come. And so. Uh, and that was that was great because you'd go up and you'd be serving for the match. You'd be serving for Wimbledon title. You'd be serving for a big tournament. You go, okay, here's a challenge, right? I've I've focused. We've we've, uh, we've we've become aware of this this issue. This is a goal of mine to be able to serve three first serves in. You know, I want to get my first serve in when I'm serving for a match. Uh, and so we're not thinking about okay love 15 or 15 all or whatever I'm not thinking about the point just thinking okay i'm going to get first serve in that's what i want to need and everything else will be automatic and so as serve volley as we serve them around to the net and then everything was reflex um so you know we were focused on certain things and if you could apply those and do those well then there's a good chance that you could walk away uh, with the victory at the end of the day if you didn't you would lose it's as simple as that and you know so it wasn't all about it was about it was about finding a goal, finding a, uh, um, something that you need to prove on and improve on that in that day, on that day. Everything comes together. Yeah. So focus on the process and then the results will follow. Yeah. I mean, it's good to have goals. There's no doubt it's good to have some, some, some form of goals. And, and you know, if you ask a young athlete or whatever, they say, hey, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And every kid puts their hand up. I want to be number one player. Well, it used to be always. I want to win Davis, win Wimbledon or whatever. Some now it's, you know, I want to be number one player in the world, whatever it happens to be. I want to win a gold medal. I want to win, hold this, win the championships. I want to be playing the World Cup. Okay, great. Um, how are you going to do that? Uh, I don't know. Right. Okay. Well, can you, if you're going to be a football player, can you kick with both feet? You know? Uh, no. Well. How are you going to be the best gym? So what do you think? Do you think you should maybe kick with your left foot as well? Okay. You know, so you've got to have a plan. Okay. Well, let's go and work on your left foot. Let's do your, let's work on your, your crosses or your, your backhand or whatever it happens to be. So, you know, this, it's good to have little goals, but I think goals are <clears throat> having a big, just, just random goal is kind of pointless, I think. Yeah. There's a question I've written down again. I, I was a young boy. I was following tennis and uh, there was in Germany, in where I used to live, there was in the biggest tennis magazine, a three-part series about you. And apparently there was some fitness testing done by Australian Institute of Sports, something like this. And you had to do tests. And Apparently, there was one test you didn't come out on top compared to all the athletes in Australia. And it was the beginning of five meter sprint or 10 meter sprint. At the end of the day, you ask if you can read with the test. Is that sto story true? Um, not quite, but what, what we did is, uh, and with Anne Quinn, we did pre season um, uh, to get an idea of where, where I was with my fitness. Um, so we did a pre-season, so that would have been in, in December, with the Australian Open being in, in mid-January. So it was mid-December, so we get a baseline of where I'm at and where, what I need to do. So we did sprints, we did the fat test, we did uh, max VO2, which is the you know, speed endurance, um, uh, hamstring quad test, uh, power test with bike, bike and, and various things like that. And one of the... And some laser beam here and then laser beam at the other end. So, um, so we went on the call, we did agility, uh, agility line, line test as well. So there's a whole bunch of things. We spent a whole day at, at, at one of the institutes um, in Melbourne, actually. And um, I did the 10 meter sprint. So it was just like basically like the first, second day of, of back in training. And uh, it was fast. Uh, we did a couple of, we did a couple of, we do two or three, test try and and then you move on um and it was fast we knew it was fast and they said wow that's the fastest we, we've we've seen um here at the, this institute uh, it was a victorian institute it wasn't worldwide or australian 
Um, and I did all the other things. Uh, I was never uh, incredible at endurance. I was more of a speed speed person. Um, so the endurance was always something I needed to continue to, to work on. Uh, but the speed I was I was good at. And as it turned out, uh, afterwards, a few days later, they said, "Gee, you know, we've blasted around in Australia. That's the fastest we've seen ever seen in Australia, a ten meter sprint." Um, and uh, Anne was like, oh, wow. And so she, she called up, went around and asked around the world, and they said, that's the fastest we've ever seen anywhere in the world, uh, the 10 meter sprint, which is a pretty standard sort of um, test. So, um, as it turned out, that became a bit of a challenge for other athletes. And, and the Australian field hockey uh, um, goalkeeper beat it a few months, a few months later. Uh, I believe, or well, six months later, maybe a year later, he he beat, he beat a goalkeeper. I mean, I thought that uh, you got to you run out and you got to got to stop that on a field a field hockey. Uh, can't remember his, his name now, but um, but that was my first day of preseason, so I figured I got a bit faster than that. So uh, and we and when Ben Johnson won the Olympics uh, when he's on his drug testing got banned, but he's famous for jumping out of the blocks so quickly and uh, my. First, my 10 meters was actually faster faster than his 10 meters and I didn't have any blocks to push off so I was very quick over a short distance but I struggled you know the endurance if you they, they, that school they used to give me a cross-country race and I was like oh no please <laughs> I used to start off winning I won the first 100 meters and then ended up about number 50 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do you have a morning routine yeah um, my morning routine is, is uh, uh, pretty simple. It's uh, uh, first thing I do is I get up and I eat some some berries uh, or some some fruit, a little bit of a little bit of simple complex carbs. I make myself a cup of tea. I live in I live in England. I love my tea. You know, the English alike. And then I do my meditation. So that's the first thing I do. Um, I do my meditation first thing in the morning. And I'll do that every day unless there's urgently have to run to an airport or something like that. Uh, so that sets that sets my day up, um, and I think that's very very important. Um, I also uh, follow up uh, doing a sports sports psychology program at the moment um, as well, and I'm going to be a be a uh, a mentor in that. Uh, but I also follow I do I follow closely a thing called a course in miracles, which is It's non-religious, really, sort of Christian-based, but it's, um, it's a uh, they call it sort of the new Bible. Um, and it, but as I said it's not it's non-religious. It's completely non-religious, but it's it's almost like uh, it, it's kind of similar to um, I don't know, Marcus Aurelius, who is a famous Stoic, and he had his book of meditations. Yeah. And it's sort of like that. It's a daily, daily, daily type of med meditation and things to, to follow. And as I'm talking to you now, all these reminders are popping up on my screen to, to do certain things. You remind yourself throughout the day uh, of things that you uh, have to do. So it sort of keeps you in a, keeps your head on your shoulders, shall we speak, and so to speak. And it's very, very appropriate in this weird situation we have in the world at the moment. Um, uh, and to, uh, to focus on the, on the things and not to get anxiety and, and, uh, Even though it's, I don't know anybody who's not stressed about about something at the moment, but it's, you know, so that's that's very important for me at the moment. Then I go straight up, pretty much have some breakfast, and get straight onto the tennis court. Uh, so I'm lucky I'm able to still work in a good environment um, with uh, uh, Brandon Nakashima, young player who's gone from zero to 200 212, I think he is at the moment. Um, uh, so he is. Uh, in six months. So he's done real, very, very well. Young American, Brandon Nakashima. He got the U S open junior semifinal last year. So I'm lucky to work with him. He's a really real talent. Um, and so that's exciting. Um, I kind of wanted to work with a young player to, and, uh, he's a, he's a great kid. I think he'll, he'll be very successful. I don't know how successful, but I think he'll be, he'll be top 30 player. Uh, I would think, um, if all goes well, I would say at least, so we'll hopefully we'll see him seated in the Grand Slams, uh, maybe even next year. I don't know, probably probably 2000, 2022, I'd say. We'd see him seated in a slam. Mm, cool. How do you prepare yourself for important moments? 
important moments. Um, well, what would be an important moment for me at the moment? Um, uh, things that things that I do that are kind of it's a little bit stressful would be just to do to do talks or, or something along those lines. I mean, for lack of better a term, a motivation type of talk. Um, some inspirational talk. I do quite a lot of those around the Grand Slams primarily, but uh, they they vary. Um, in a weird in a weird way, I sort of I kind of just back my my intuition and my confidence. Um, uh, I've learned to sort of trust my my intuition a lot, and uh, I'm not a great planner. Um, uh, I, I, I kind of let things happened to me and uh i tend to react from that because in my in my opinion i don't really know what's good for me um and when i say that is i say that because i'm not a child anymore um you know i'm not so i don't you know i don't have to follow what my mum and dad say um but in, in this weird weird a crazy world that there is, I don't think anybody really knows what's, what's good for them. We sort of follow a path of, of what we, sh what we've been told we should be doing, whether that's, you know, having a job, having a family, doing this and doing that. Um, that's just, we're just, that's, uh, as famous, um, uh, psycho psychologist, psych psychotherapist, uh, Frederick Nietzsche used to say, it's just like following the sheep. Um, so it's, um, I don't believe in following the sheep. I sort of believe in getting guided by a higher power than that. And it's not always easy to tune into that higher power, but I tend to think that they, that they're leading the way. And, uh, in the middle of all this coronavirus crap, I think something good will come out of it. Uh, the world certainly, the earth is certainly pissed off the way that we've been treating it. Um, I've been an environmentalist for a long time. You can see some of some of this stuff that's happening. Certainly the bushfires in Australia was so obvious it was going to happen. Um, nobody, they, they, you know, I think there's going to be a, a quite a bit of anger coming around for the way that the, the politicians in the world have let, have let us down. There's no doubt they've let us down. And after all this, um, I don't know when this will come out, but, uh, you know, we're talking about if, if it's, if this the, the coronavirus has jumped from a bat to a, or a snake to a human. Uh, why haven't the Chinese locked down these these wet markets? They're still going. They're still selling bats. I mean, it's it's either that or there's you know they manufactured something to sort of try and bring the Western world down. It's whatever it happens to be. There's something seriously wrong. The world has had enough of this, and we got to start thinking of a bit a bit more kind to the human beings, human, other human beings, and to the and to the earth. And uh, somehow that'll. God will bloody, God will lead us the way. I know it sounds very religious, and I'm not so I'm not very religious, but I'm trying to, to find out, trying to set, get a sense of uh, what's in, what's important to me, and, and go with my intuition. And it's 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 kind of really tough. It's really tricky because you, your brain just starts trying to take over, and it's just trying to separate the ego and and, and your inter intuition. And it's it's not that easy. How do you do that? Well, it's practice. Um, you know, I said I'm doing my psychology course. I'm doing my course in miracles. I like to, you know, I like to read uh, uh, a lot of stuff about self-help books. And people often read books. I like rock and roll. It's ironic. It's funny. I like rock and roll books because I like all the wild stuff that Ronnie Wood's done or Keith Richards or uh, Motley Crue. I like that sort of, that's that other side of me. Like, oh man, that's crazy. How can you guys do that? Uh, but the other side is that there's a self-help help that's that's pretty much more like all I try and do is become a better better human being and a better kind of person and and a more forgiving person to myself because I was pretty harsh on myself for a long time I was pretty tough um, pretty unforgiving on myself so um, I think I've got a lot better at that uh, but it's it's practice I mean you can rewire the brain you know you can rewire the brain you know it's it's patterns it's just old patterns and that you know, people lose arms and legs and half their head, brain in accidents and they can they still function perfectly well. So the plasticity of the brain and the mind is, is phenomenal. But you just have to get into good habits of positive, of well-being and positive thinking and, and think a different way. And you got to be a, the most important thing is awareness. And I was, you know, I've been very aware of some of the, my habits, the things that I was doing wrong. 
and I've been trying to change them and it's, and it's worked. It's not easy, but it, it's I think one of the best things I could possibly do. And all starts with awareness. And often it's your wife or your kids that point it out to you. Hey, you've been doing this. You were so-and-so. <laughs> but I've had, that, I've had that pointed out to me quite a few times. Yeah. Well, you're still, you're so angry. Why are you angry all the time? I'm not angry. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, maybe I am angry. Uh, and that was actually one of the first things my father said to me when I, he just suggested, my coach suggested a sports psychologist back in 1985. You know, he said, do you want to work with a sports psychologist? And I didn't know what that meant. I thought he meant psych, psych, psychiatric, go to a psychiatric ward and get, and get put in a, in a padded cell and uh, a straight jacket, you know, straight walk around like this for, for a month and get electric shocks. I didn't know what he was talking about. And, and he said, well, you did get pretty angry. And I literally stormed, screamed, yelled, at, swore at my dad and coach and then stormed out of the room. And I sort of, after a while, went, hmm, they might have a point here. <laughs> uh, I am behaving like, a, like an idiot. Um, so, you know, and that's one of the challenges of me. And that's uh, for my life is to, is to you know, fear, hear uh, criticism and to be able to stop and, and and think, okay, you know, what's this about without reacting? How do you overcome setbacks? Yeah, well, if, if I've learned anything, if I've learned anything in this life, is that there's a meaning, there is, a, there is something positive to come out of everything. And uh, uh, if I look back at my life, and I hope that I've still got another good 20 years or more, um, every one of my setbacks has been has turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me um at the time it was is horrific you know injuries um you know certainly that divorce separation various things like that um you know, you know financial issues with uh with divorce all that sort of stuff um but in but And I look back at it now, you know, and it's easy to look back and, and, and see, but it's actually that my growth has come from that, my, my growth. So these the setbacks um, and, you know, some form of pressure and stress is important that, that pushes you on and motivates you. You can, yeah, sure, you sit there and you, you mope and you cry and you drink a few beers and then you drink a few more beers and then you wake up the next day and go, oh, that didn't help. Oh, I sort of feel worse now. <laughs> Uh, you say you learn from mistakes, but you know, having these injuries, I've had to go back and learn about my tennis, learn about my body, you know, physiotherapy. I've had to, you know, come back and um, do all sorts of stuff. And so many of these comebacks, uh, setbacks have been in the, in the long run, have actually been fantastic. So, you know, as tennis players and as athletes, particularly tennis players, you know, we have setbacks all the time, we have setbacks every point. Almost, you know, if we win, if we win three points in a row, we're lucky. So our three, every second point, every other point is a setback. You know, we lose a game, we lose a set, we lose a match, we lose a tournament. We, you know, we got to bounce back. I mean, tennis players are very, very resilient. If you're not, then you're you're going you're going to be out, and 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 so you have to forget about stuff and move on. And I think that's one of the. I think men are pretty good at that in general. They sort of like, okay, let's pick something. Let's, let's move on. Let's get, let's, that's, um, I'm not saying women aren't, but I think particularly men tennis players. And I think that's why we're seeing the tennis at the moment. It's just phenomenal. These five sets are just ruthless tennis because the players just reset, 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 reset all the time and, and, and move on. And, and um, you know, okay, you, you get upset, but you got to move on, got to reset. And, um, You know, that's you don't have any other option. You just got to keep moving forward. Yeah, yeah. I saw that in an interview uh, you gave uh, that in '84 in the U.S. Open semifinal, you were one point away from making it to the final. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it took you a long time to recover from that, but you said that made you the player you ultimately became, right? Yeah, I didn't even think about that one. Yeah, that's right. I had um, on Super Saturday, the original, the original Super Saturday. Yeah. Uh, they, um, I lost the Lendl 7-6 in the fifth set and had a match point and um, hit a fan very good volley. I thought when I hit the volley, I thought I hit, I'd won the point. And Lendl chased it down and hit a perfect lob over, over my head. Um, saved the match point and then I served an ace the next point, uh, which got called a fault. 
It was right on the line, um, which would have given me a second match point. Anyway, I lost the match. And then for six months after that, it was it was uh, it, it was like something out of a movie. You know, you had the movies or the TV series, and the guy's in bed and he's oh, and he wakes up. Oh, you know, you go, oh, it never happens. Bullshit. It did happen. It happened all the time. I used to wake up and just go, oh my god, I blew it. I blew it. That was my only chance. That was my. And you just don't know as a young player. You don't know if you're going to get another chance. And uh, and for a long time. Um, cause I got injured that next year for a long time. I thought that was my, that was it. That was the end of my career. That was a highlight of my career. I had a match point and I blew it and the, to get to the U S open final. Um, but it gave me so much determination to, to beat him and to beat, to just to be a better player. It also gave me confidence to know that I just about beat the number one player in the world at you know, the age of 19. So, but it, it did, you know, really fire me up to get, to get going. So that followed by a back injury, followed by a child on the way, you know, there was one horror after the other. Oh my God, I lost that match. That was, I blew it. Oh my God, my back's gone. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to come back. I've got a child on the way. Are you kidding me? I've got a child on the way. I'm only 20. Um, you know, these, these setbacks all the time. And you know what? You sit there, you can mope or you can get off your ass and get, do something. And hell, I got off my ass and I've worked my butt off and I got, got the right people behind me, a sports psychologist. I got Ann Quinn, I got my coach. I said, "Hey, let's get, let's do this. Let's let's be the best that I can possibly be." And uh, and that's that's still the you know the, the rule that I I follow to this day. Yeah. Um, the next question is a bit of a difficult one. Part of what I'm doing this series here with high performers is also to show quote unquote normal people that high performers. Face similar challenges as normal people. <laughs> you were the Australian next big thing, and you had it all. And in your book, in your autobiography, biography, you bravely talked about mental health issues. Is that yeah. something you can talk about? Uh, sure. Um, what I what I want to yeah. get at is like you were in a situation like where everyone thought like you have it all, right? You living the dream. But at some point, you had mental health issues. How did you yeah. recognize something is wrong? Well, I wouldn't want to kill myself. Uh, that would that would be uh, <laughs> that would probably be it. Um, very depressed. I, th I think I really had a grasp of reality uh, looking back at it. But uh, as I said, you know, I, here I was. Uh, as you said, I had everything. I lost this match. I had a child on the way. The stress involved in that. Then I had injuries. Um, then I had the success, um, but I, I, you know, I wasn't really happy. Um, in actual fact, one of the most miserable parts personally of my life was when I won Wimbledon. Um, uh, the, at home was so stressful, uh, with a young baby, my girlfriend, incredibly stressed. Um, I had my coach and my, my sports psychologist in my house at the same time, um, She's a strong Norwegian woman. She wasn't going to go make food for everybody. She'd go make your own food, uh, you know, which had more stress <laughs> to everything, uh, you know, and it was, it was, it was horrific. So the only way I could really, I actually learned to switch my mind off completely uh, and get out of the house and then just focus on tennis. And that was like, okay, I can focus on tennis. Um, so that was, uh, you know, I learned, I learned to do that. And as, as a part of my es escape, but You know when that all disappears and you're in, and you you you're injured. Um, uh, you know you, I think you, there was certain things that I, um, you know I hadn't 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 managed very well uh, and hadn't dealt with, and um, you know I, that caused you know bad very bad depression and uh, um, you know coming back from one of my injuries I can't remember which one now but I was uh, sitting playing a legend legends tournament couldn't get into the real tournaments um i was playing a legends tournament they said well you're done i was 31 or 32 whatever it was 30 and they said well why don't you play some of these legends tournaments i, said, I don't want to play a legends tournament i want to play the tour and well come and play the anyway i played the legend that's very screwing around and they'll you know it was you know half and i said i don't want to be here and i just left i just left the tournament and uh they said all right well You left the tournament, you're banned from the tour. And I said, oh, I don't really care, you know. 
Um, and then I realized, shit, I haven't got an income anymore then. Um, so, you know, that was, it was just, I realized, hey, my life's got to change here. You know, I'm not very happy and I got to, got to deal with it. So I actually went into, um, I got some counseling, um, got some marriage counseling. I got, got, I went into uh, a rehab place in, in a very famous one in Arizona, in the U S and, um, it was, uh, and all sorts of people there. And that was, that was really fantastic. Actually. Um, I spent, I spent Christmas. I, I remember getting out of there on new year's, new year's day, 2000. Um, and, uh, but I've been in there for a few weeks over Christmas time. I met all people, all sorts of real big problems. I mean, I thought I didn't, I didn't really have any problems, but, um, uh, you know, all, all, just this, this some of the some of the things were horrific that happened to these people and the issues that they had and and I felt quite actually normal after that but I also had the determination to you know somebody giving me a game plan hey yeah if you follow this if you do this you'll be you'll be okay and some of it was going to meetings and counselling and all that sort of stuff so I, I followed that and then somebody gave me some advice I kept an open mind about it and asked for help I mean it's very hard to ask for help I, I didn't think I needed to ask for help. But, uh, you know, that's one of the toughest things to do is really to ask, ask for help. And um, that was, a, that was a, a good thing I did and it was provided to me. And, and so, again, I got a, got a bit of a game plan. Some people are way smarter than me. Hey, listen, if you follow this and it's something that I continue to follow even today, you know, I get up and do my meditation. And that's my, a massive part of that. Yeah. Who's your role model and why? Who is my role model? Oh, gee. Uh, I always said that my tennis heroes were sort of Jimmy Connors and McEnroe and Borg for different reasons. Um, the way they played te played tennis in their, in their life. Um, I've always had great admiration for people who, who are um, servants. So servants to com the community or people, uh, you know, Mother Teresa sort of person. Um, uh, you know, Gandhi, these, these type of people, I great fascination in them. No more so than Jesus. Um, I said, again, I'm not really religious, but I just have a lot of respect for, for these sort of people. Um, and I think that's a great, that's, um, I think the older you get, the more you want to give back. Um, you're doing that with your podcast. I think there's something that you want to, you want to do. Uh, and, um, and I think it's really very re rewarding. So, uh, I have great ad admiration for people who do nothing, uh, do a lot for no, for no reward. I mean, how they do that, I don't know. Whether that's um, people who you know work at uh, 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 old you know old people's homes and and donate their time and, and things like that. I mean, they're right, fantastic, and they never get any thank you. You know, and and you know you know who don't get the thanks hardly any get any thanks. And I think the most amazing people is. Um, and, and people throw this term around a lot. There's just like, you're a hero. I say, I'm not a hero. I'm just a tennis player, you know, um, you know, or Federer is a hero. Nadal is a hero. Yeah, he's a hero because they've got a skill that, 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 that people don't see. And it's a, it's an amazing skill that everybody wants to watch. Um, but the real heroes are, are the, you know, the mother of three, single mother of three who are getting, putting their th kids through school and getting up and somehow putting food on the table. They're the real heroes. You know, and I just, you know, I think it's just absolutely brilliant for people to do that. I mean, and what thanks do they get? They don't get anything. They just get a kid screaming at the end of the day. Uh, they don't want to go to bed. And they get a kid screaming, wake up in the morning, don't want to go to school. <laughs> what thanks do they get? They get a husband who doesn't want to give them any money. You know, um, you know, that, yeah, it just goes on. Well, what thanks do they ever get? They don't, but they keep, they, they forge on. And, and that's, um, that's some great strength. But again, that is giving. So, uh, you know, it's amazing what, rewards you can get from actually giving and and it doesn't always come you know it's, I, I have a lot of charities i like doing that but there's there is years where you know my the charities that i've founded or i'm involved in they call me up they say can you come and do this and i'm just just sometimes i just say no i, I just i just don't have the energy i just don't have the doesn't and then the next year i do 10 things um so it's it's it doesn't always if it's a, sometimes it's a drag you force yourself and I think we, as humans, we really got to think of what is sacrifice. We're not supposed to sacrifice. I don't believe we're supposed to really sacrifice, even though 
we always the really points to Jesus on the cross or whoever you know was sacrificed for us. It's, that's just all a whole mixed up thing that's gone on um, in our in our, psych, in our psychic in our psyche. Um, God doesn't want us to sacrifice, um, but you know, but there is certain things you have to do. You have to wipe. If you got a baby, you got to clean it. <laughs> you know, you got to do these things. But that's you kind of enjoy that. I mean, I've never wouldn't say I've ever really enjoyed changing any of my four kids' nappies, but but I did it, and there's a time I spent with them I really enjoyed. <laughs> yeah, I believe that. Uh, there's one question I wanted to ask you. I don't know. I didn't know any better place to put it. I enjoyed the way you play tennis. I always supported you, whoever you played. There was one match I supported your opponent. The Wimbledon quarterfinal in 1988. Yeah, uh, Boris. <laughs> <laughs> there was a cool. moment you ran for a drop shot. Mm. You tumbled over the net. Then Boris thought it's funny to tumble over the net. Yeah. From your reaction, it, it seemed like you didn't think it's funny. No, I did not think that was very funny. <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, I was. It was a tough. I was defending Wimbledon champion then, and that was. Uh, um, it's a tough. You know, it's an honor to be a defending champion, but I was. I was certainly not in great form then, and I managed to get through to to the quarterfinals somehow, struggling along. Um, but I didn't really felt I had any chance to to beat Boris if he was playing the way he he was, um, and uh, I get to say that. <sighs> You know, I get on well. I get on well with Boris now. I like him. Um, and we always had a, we always had a. It was always my belief that you're always friendly to your opponent, um, and you know, at least you're in the locker room a whole bunch of the time, and and uh, you always say hello and you're friendly and respectful. I think. Uh, I think as far a few things that Boris said and Lendl as well said uh, uh, about me personally. I was a young father, and they were. They had no idea about being a father or anything, but they were very critical about, you know, my game and how I'm dragging my family around the world and stuff like that. And I, that was really not very nice. It was so, so, um, though I was respectful to Boris, I don't think I, I, I didn't really appreciate him, him saying that. And, uh, so here I was, you know, at Wimbledon quarterfinal and just hanging in, hanging on, you know, he was, he was beating me and everything seemed to be going wrong. And he had a, uh, A ball that just dribbled off the end of his racket at the net, and I chased in and I you know, said, uh, "Hit the ball," and then tried not to go into the into the uh, into the net. And eventually, I couldn't, and I was holding this, just balancing. And eventually, I fell into the net and fell over the net. I thought, "Oh no!" I just lost the point. You know what? What else can go wrong? It was just complete like <laughs> shot that he hit. You know. And then Boris thought it was funny that he would jump jump over the net and make fun of me. Um, At that stage, I didn't think it was very funny. Him, him, he was just making fun. Yeah, you know, he's winning. Yeah, it's always it's always easy to make fun of somebody when you're winning. So, I thought he was just a bad loser. And and uh, so, uh, you know, in my typical Australian way, I just told him told him that. And in, in a matter of fact, <laughs> that I didn't think he was very funny, and he should go go uh, go stick something somewhere where the sun doesn't shine. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best advice you received and who gave it to you? Oh, gee, I, so much good advice out there. Um, I think you've got to sort of find your own way. I, I think initially, um, one, of the, one of the things my, my father told me amongst when I, was, when I was going through that really tough, tough period, um, and I think it's very true, and I didn't realize it, but... I think it actually is a. Uh, I think it is a niche, a niche, uh, Frederick Nietzsche uh, saying. But um, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Yeah. Um, as my father used to say, it the steel is tempered in the fire, and the steel goes in the fire and comes out stronger. So you know what doesn't doesn't kill you make you stronger. And and um, I didn't really quite understand that, but uh, that was that was. Um, He was, he was dead right. So that was one of the, the first really big, good bits of advice that I, that I understood to say, you know, just hang in there. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll come out the other end pretty strong. And, and um, the other one I think I probably uh, tattooed on my arm. I don't know if we, you, can, you can see that. Yeah. yeah, I have it here as a note. That would have been my next question. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
this two shall pass. Yeah. So, um, which means, you know, the, but there's a reason why I've got that rose. Uh, there's a Dali rose, Salvador Dali. It's a nice, nice tattoo, but the, um, the, uh, you know, this two shall pass. So the bad will pass, but the good will pass. So smell the roses. Um, and that's what the rose is for, just the smell of roses. My father died and a good friend of mine died in a short period of time together. And I realized, you know, that I didn't really, you know, I really miss them. And, you know, sometimes you don't, I come in, I'm running around and I come back home and running off to do this and do that. And sometimes it's nice to sit down and stop and smell the roses. And so I've made that a habit of mine to whenever, whatever I get walking down the road or going used to go for a run, and uh, if I saw, saw a rose bush, I would stop and smell the rose bush and then go off, continue on to my run. And funny enough, here in the house here, they've got beautiful roses down there. And I was just smelling them this morning. So it reminds me of my father, reminds me of my friend, it reminds me. <sighs> just slow down for a second. It's a, life's okay. Yeah. That's funny because actually the fellow Aussie, um, Sam Willoughby, I'm not sure whether you know who that is. He's a... <laughs> B BMX Supercross rider, uh, <laughs> silver medalist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yep, had an accident. Yep. He's paralyzed now. Uh, he actually said, smell the rose a bit more is one of the best advice he received. All right. So, uh, when did you get that tattoo? Uh, well, uh, what year? I'm confused the year. Just after my father died, passed away. So, uh, uh, I don't know, 12 years ago, 10 years Ten years ago, twelve, twelve years ago, something like that. Anyway, yeah, yeah it was a, a interesting period of my life. You know, when you retire as a sports person and you're playing legends, and you, you know, you, you kind of, I don't know, yeah, when you, when you're at the end of a career, it's kind of interesting because you don't know where the next part of the career is. And uh, um, I got it in when I was actually, I know, I got it when I was working. And it was after I was working with Philip Hussis. So, uh, Mark Philip Hussis. So I started getting into coaching and really enjoying that. And it was, it was an interesting, uh, interesting time because coaching is a different, it's a different skill set. There's no doubts about it. It's, it. You can be a good player, but you may not be able to communicate. And so that was something I had, I needed to learn to do is communicate as well. Yeah. Back in the days, how did a typical training day look like? Um, or oh, it, it, it varied depending on where the tournament was, where you were in the tournament or how far out of the tournament you were. Um, lucky I had, uh, Anne, Anne to, to make a program for me, but typically it would start off, you know, in a more in morning warming, a warm up. Uh, when I look back at the warm ups that I used to do, that would be my, that'd be a full workout for me now, <laughs> just the warm up. Um, we would, we would warm up. Uh, for a good 40 minutes, including, um, you know, sprints and ad agility, rolling ball rolling balls, doing ladders, all sorts of stuff. But, you know, we would do, we would literally do sprint sessions. Sometimes we'd actually go in the gym and lift, you know, do big leg presses. And uh, some before matches, we, we did that as well. Um, and that was, that was some of the training that, uh, uh, or Ben Johnson actually, and some of the, and Linford Christie and some of these sprinters used to do. They used to lift really heavy weights, yeah. uh, not a lot, not a lot of times, but just a few times to really fire up the muscles. So we used to sometimes go into the gym um, and push these massive weights, leg weights and, and various things, and, and then go on the tennis court. And the tennis court session would be, um, I'd do probably two in the morning, um, two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, followed by uh, some form of uh Off, sometimes we do the gym afterwards, uh, other times not. So I learned from Jimmy Connors that uh, a really good lesson. I remember my coach, when I was, I was first on the circuit, Ian Barclay pulled me aside and he said, hey, come watch Jimmy Connors practice. And I remember exactly where it was. It was near here in California, actually, in, in Indian well, near where Indian Wells used to be. And... Um, I was playing, uh, I think one of my first times I got in the tournament there and Connors was on the practice court and, we, and he said, oh, he said, come on, yeah, come on, we, we've got some time, let's go and watch Connors play. So Connors walked on and he warmed up for 10 minutes and then he just went absolutely flat out. And I swear 
Pentagon that if that could have been the centre court of Roland Garros or the US Open or Wimbledon, that, that practice court, he went so hard. He, he was going, you know, he, he chased every single ball. Every shot was just like the most important shot he ever had. And at the change of ends, he would, you know, he would, he would have a timing for, for, for uh, 30, uh, one minute. So he'd sit down and he would, he was playing somebody, he would sledge them. He would, he'd give them a hard time. He'd, he'd get in their face and do a bad line. Call, he'd get in the other, he'd say, what is that? What's that? Like, that like, oh, you're, you're a freaking fucking cheat. You know, and, he'd, and we were sitting there going, this is a practice match. It was one of the other players. And he'd be like, you're like, shit. He said, and it, was, it was unbelievable. He said, what is this? This guy's insane. This is just practice. But no, that's what he did. And he went out. And then afterwards, he shook hands, said, thank you very much. Same time tomorrow. And the other guy began, I'm not practicing with you. You just, you just wore at me. You just accused me of cheating. You just tried to hook me in a line call. You're... And the guy would go, yeah, all right. <laughs> and he, he would train unbelievable. So my practice sessions, when I trained two hours, you'd walk off the court and you'd be absolutely dead. Then it'd be, it'd be nonstop, two on ones, really hard work, practice matches. Uh, and then you'd do it again in the afternoon. So there was no, there's no time to mess around. There's no time to sit and chit chat. Anybody can play for four hours. It's half the time you're not running and you're talking and you're changing ends for five minutes. What's the point? There's no point whatsoever. So everything would be high intensity, almost, almost everything, except for a massage and you, at the end of the day, be nice. <laughs> Good. We're coming to the end of the interview. Uh, I would like to do something which some people call a lightning round. I ask a question, you give a quick answer. Oh, okay. Okay. Your I'll preference. Quick... Your preference. Kuyong Stadium or Melbourne Park? Uh, well, uh, I'll say Kuyong Stadium because uh, well, because I was, I was spending quite a lot of time there actually not that long ago. Okay. Best player to never win Wimbledon? Uh, jeepers. I don't know. Uh, most talented player not to win Wimbledon? Um, Nastasi. Nastasi didn't win, did he? He lost in the final twice, I think. Okay. Best serve and volley player ever? Oh, jeepers. I don't know. Uh, gee, I don't know. There's a bunch of them all. I'll say uh, Sampras, I'll say Becker, I'll say McEnroe, uh, I'll say Rafter, um, Jeebus, yeah, um, yeah, Henman is right up there. Maybe Henman's the best, best serve volley and ever to win Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. A discussion we had as kids, best volleys in the biz, Edbeck or Kirsch? Oh, I'd give it to Stefan. I'd give the nod to Stefan. I have to. I think he, I think he was a better volley than me, actually. Do you change the grip on the forehand and backhand volley? Uh, sometimes, yeah, but not very often. No, not for standard stuff. No, only for the really wide stuff or the really low stuff. I will open it up a little bit or close it for a sort of drive volley. So, I have about mm, probably about six or seven grips that I use throughout throughout a, a, a tennis match. Interesting. Last on one. Serve, serve as well. I use a lot of different grips on serve. Okay. Last one. If you could travel back in time, 32 years, Aussie Open final, 88, fifth set, six all, break point down with t today's technology, would you challenge the backhand? Yeah. Backhand volley call? Yeah, I was hoping you wouldn't bring that up. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was, yeah, I was 15, 40 down. Then he hit a backhand volley right through the line. Uh, it, was, it was definitely half in, half out, maybe even more than half in. And they, the umpire called it out. Um, yep, yeah, definitely would have. I definitely would have won that point on a Hawkeye challenge. And Matt, Matt says it too. He says, "Oh yeah, that was on. I was in." Um, he still had a break point though, so he might maybe got the sec. Maybe would have got the next break point, but uh, I certainly would have still been alive. Yeah, that was a heartbreaker. But I knew the lines. The umpire was not, even though it was right under his nose, he was not going to change that call at six all on the fifth set. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Um, who would be? Who would, I tell you what, I'd, you should be, you should interview Jimmy Connors. I think Jimmy Connors is a great. <laughs> I don't know if you can get to him though. He's not that easy to, to get to, but uh, he's a he's a fantastic interviewer. And he's uh, um, 
Yeah, uh, he's, a, he's a bit of a hero of mine. I don't know if you get through to to, to Mac to McEnroe, but uh, um, gee, there's a lot of there's a lot of really good athletes. I, I, I tell you, if you can, um, one of my heroes growing up was Edwin Moses. Oh yeah, four hundred meter, four hundred meter hurdler. Who I think I don't think he ever. I think he lost once in his whole career. Something something stupid like that. Something stupid. He was a hero of mine because we used to have the same sponsor, Deodora. So I used to oh, follow yeah. him all the time. Uh, but that would be interesting because his career went for forever and he never got beaten. So um, that'd be, there, there's a challenge for you. I have no idea how to get hold of him. I think if somebody, if I come up in, in a, in a, in my, through my phone book, I'll send, I'll send it to you. That would be great. Cool. Hey. Oh, I'll tell I, you what. Bear, you, know, got, you know, Bear Grylls? Bear, Gr Bear Grylls, um, the, the, the guy that does all that, the, the, the goes into the jungle and eats food and eats uh, eats lizards and all that sort of stuff to to uh, stay alive. You ever heard of Bear Grylls? Um, oh, he's very famous. Uh, okay, no, uh, he's he's uh, he's an ex um, Royal Marine, and now he does all these TV shows. He goes in and tells people how to survive on the on the on the on the land by eating things and he's mad on tennis he loves his okay. loves his tennis loves his sport but he's also had a crazy career because he's been in the marines and now he's a very famous you look up bear grills then you'll just see how much tv stuff he's done anyway i've got his number he's, he's a fantastic guy to interview actually he's really fun okay. he's, he's super good at uh, touch tennis which is te mini tennis yeah, with I, a I foam ball it. Yeah, he played. He killed me. He killed me. I had no chance to beat him. No <laughs> chance to beat him. He's really good. I guess it's a different skill at a, in a way. Yeah, yeah. He's I've seen slight, it. It's, it's really, uh, he's very clever. It's good. Hmm. I listened to the podcast you were on at the Howie Games. And you mentioned, oh, yeah. you, yeah. mentioned you want to raise awareness for the situation of the indigenous Australians. And you are yeah. involved in a philanthropic project at this moment tell us more about that yeah um the uh the australian indigenous community the, I, i'm involved in in a um i suppose supporting uh supporting one community who um uh australian many australian indigenous people are some of the poorest people certainly the poorest people in australia um they've had a really tough time They um, have been treated very, very, very badly by the Australian government. It's one of Australia's ugly secrets, uh, dirty secrets, how badly the Indigenous people are, are supported um, or how... Uh, and and the, uh, the charity that we have, it supports actual community. So um, in Australia, we have, in the Indigenous community have between two and 300 different languages. So um, at the moment, they're sort of all lumped a lot of them are lumped together, depending on where, which part of Australia. This is in the central of Australia in Alice, called Alice Springs. It's incredibly, ridiculously hot. Uh, 50, de 50 degrees Celsius, 45 degrees of summertime, freezing cold. It's desert, freezing cold in wintertime. And um, they, uh, there's three different, three or four different communities that have been forced to come and live together in, in Alice Springs. And it's, Their languages are so different, um, and their their um, uh, the traditions are so very different, and they're they're dying out these these traditions. And their traditions, they know how to live on the land. They know bush bush medicine. They that their 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 languages all disappeared. Aboriginals don't write language. They don't write it down. So it's all taught by, and and all the old people have got diabetes, and they're getting old, and they're dying, and it's 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 quite tragic to think that we can let they'll lose their culture and. So we support one of these communities to help to help to. It's called Children's Ground. So we get the children that can work go on the ground with the, with the adults and and learn their language, uh, learn English, of course, as well, which is the second second language usually. Um, but they're all shoved together. So it, it's almost like putting, even though they have a similar look in many ways, they're, they're put all put together in in a suburb, and it'd be the same. The languages are like African. To German, to Chinese, and they're all put together. And the, the white man says, "Well, you guys are black. You go, you just live together." And it doesn't. Can you imagine putting those people together? Literally, the next door neighbor is a 
guy speaks a completely different language. And the, so it's, um, you know, there's, it's, there's so many different big, big problems there. Uh, there's a movie out that will explain it. A fantastic movie. It's won a lot of awards and it's called In My Blood It Runs. And I recommend anybody who's interested in what's going on in Australia um, or doesn't quite understand, as I'm still learning myself, about the indigenous communities uh, around the world. We're talking about the same in, in, uh, in, in everywhere, in Alaska and, and even in Norway, all the indig- a lot of indigenous people, um, Poly- Polynesians and, um, uh, you know, and through, throughout Asia, they have a lot of the similar problems. Um, and it's called In My Blood It Runs, and it's about a young boy. They follow him for about three years and see, all the, see the problems. And he's one of the very lucky ones, this kid. Uh, so it's an award-winning movie that's, that's out and you just keep an eye out for it. You might be able to get it on Netflix or something uh, or YouTube, I don't know, uh, soon enough. It's only kind of just come out, so maybe wait a few months. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that situation until I heard you talking no. about it and then I looked into it. it I was always on... Again, it's horrific, actually. It's really horrific. Yeah, I... Again, excuse my ignorance, but I was always under the impression this whole Katie, Katie Freeman story around the 2000 Olympics was some kind of reconciliation. Yeah. But, um, apparently. It's yeah. Not. Uh, no, no, I didn't know either. No, it's, uh, I feel very ignorant as well. And that's why I tried to, to, to help. In actual fact, one of the things, the projects that we did to support in the community, the lady that, that's called the, the Aranda people, that's the name of the, uh, the community, the Aboriginal community. She owns, it's her land, the Alice Springs. And Alice Springs is a small, it's a capital city. Uh, it's a small, it's a, uh, it's a small, uh, well, smallish town. It's 30, 40, 50,000 people uh, in the middle of Australia. And there's casinos everywhere there and there are rest. And she lives on a bit of land in a caravan. It's got broken windows. And if I showed you a photo, you wouldn't believe it. There's sheds that would look like, not as good as what would, you would see in your backyard in, in Holland or, or Germany uh, that would hold your, your lawnmower on your shovel or your tools. That's, they kind of look like that. And that's where they live uh, in freezing cold weather. They have no water and no electricity. And that's their, it's their land. And the, the, the white man wanted them off the land so they could put, I think, solar power or do whatever they want to do, build a hotel. And she said, no, I'm not leaving. This is my land. I'm not going to leave. And she's fought, she's fought for 40 years and she finally got water. She's finally got water now. Now that is against all human rights is not to provide water. But this is not one, this is common around Australia, but they do not have water. They do not have electricity, a common, a basic right, human right. Uh, Australians, government, Australian uh, government have been, breaching human rights laws for, for decades, decades, and it's still going on. But finally, we've got, we've got official approval that she can have a house, she can build a house, and she can have water. Can you believe that? 40 years. And this is her land. She's had it for those people. Her people have had it, that land, for 50,000 years. 50,000 years. White man comes on and says, no, that's not your land anymore. It's, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. But this is what happens in Australia. We, we have a big, big, uh, you know, I, I don't see, a, see any other way of calling it other than racism. That uh, not everybody, of course, but there is a big, a big strain of racism through a lot of Australian politics. What else is going on in Pet Cash moment, at, at Pet Cash Live at this moment in time? Oh, Gee, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to survive, really, I think, uh, at the moment. But, um, you know, I think, I think some of the interesting things for me is that uh, um, I'm doing this you know, psych- psychological pro- psychology program. Um, and, it, and I will be actually going, decided to go and, and, and uh, teach it online. We'll go with the, with, the, with the founder and the teacher. And, and uh, you know, I'd love to tell you about it at some stage later and it's it's we're going to it's it's quite broad but we're going to si- simplify it a little bit for athletes so okay. uh, so certain certain uh certain principles that we will have that i think would be very good for athletes so uh i'm looking to get that up and going you know in the next six months or so so um 
hopefully we're not still locked up in six months' time. I hope not. <laughs> That'd be terrible. But uh, we'll be, uh, yeah. I'll um, I'll let you know, and and uh, um, we'll we'll see. Um, I'm hoping to bring that to the ATP as well. They they realise that they needed. They haven't really got one of the issues with tennis that I've always found is that as a junior or a national association, you build these kids up to say, you're going to be the next big thing or you can make it, you can do it. And then when they don't, then what do they do? They just left. They're thrown off. So you go, sorry, you didn't make the squad this year. Bye-bye. Good luck. Right. And there's a 16 year old kid, boy, girl, uh, they've broken their heart and they've maybe quit school. I don't know, whatever could happen. Maybe they've been injured and they're left. They have, there's no duty of care from any of these associations. I'm not saying any of all of them. I don't know all of them, but certainly the ones that I've been aware of. There's no duty of care of mental well-being care for any of these these young people, and there should be. And I'm I'm worried that one day we will see a kid, you know, get depressed and and drive his car off the bridge or something, and go, oh my goodness, you know, that's terrible. So what what do you expect? You build these kids up and you just throw them away. Yeah. And um, that's the tough thing about sport, you know. If you're not up the top, you're um, you're sometimes discarded. Mm. Yeah, so I'm looking to bring something. Looking to bring some form of simple, basic, uh, you know, principle psychology 101 in in this sort of format. And the ATP, I know, is starting to do something about it. I've talked to them about it. I said, actually, we're we're onto this. We're doing this. We realise that we haven't done haven't done enough, and that every retiring player and every young player coming on the tour should should know these these things and, and they get some some form of awareness as i just talked about awareness is such a massive thing um and it's a lot of it is our history of course you know what our parents have told us and what their parents have told them and their parents have told them and how where they've come from um so it's not that simple but awareness is a will go a long way where can people find you um Look, I've got uh, I've got a website. Um, uh, it's uh, patcash.net. So I've got some some. Uh, also, I've got uh, some some tennis tips and fitness tips and various things like that. But there are also quite a, a few on on uh, on YouTube. And I was going to say I've got a, I've got a channel. My son my son was dealing with it. I don't, I'm guessing it's Pat on Pat Cash somewhere. But it is. I've um, I checked I've it out. A, it is Pat Cash. Okay, there you go. Because um, he used to. Put a lot. We had. I did a lot of coaching, little mini coaching tips, little um, three-minute sort of little tips, um, and um, on sort of some of the principles that, that I that I've found work in in uh, in, in teaching. So there's um, very fun fun things like that are, are on, and um, yeah, hopefully I'll be. Uh, I should be getting onto that right now, shouldn't I? Really, now I've got a bit of extra time to fix up my website, but there'll be some good inf info on there. Yeah, really cool. And it all, is all my all the real Pat Cash is on uh, um, Twitter and uh, um, Instagram. So okay. I post stuff on there as well. Really cool. Pat, thanks a lot for your time. That was awesome. Thanks, Christian. My pleasure. Uh, great to talk to you, and uh, we'll be in touch. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Have a good one. <laughs>